I, I, I know this whole series I've talked about, you know, using 100 kVp, but remember, we've got a skull that we need to scan through at 100, so 120 kVp is good. Um, with hybrid and model-based any reconstruction, you can go as low as you want. And now remember, I, I never, ever use a pitch greater than 1.1 because then you're scanning too fast, okay? And of course, depending on your collimation, which scanner you have, you always, always go thin as possible. So whenever I do my test bolus, I always do it at the elbow. Now, if I have a fracture, I just do it at the same level at the abdominal aorta because you remember, we don't want to scan, like we've talked about before, scanning, um, you know, uh, in the opposite direction. In CT, peripheral angiography, we can't do that because once we monitor here at the ascending aorta, or at, once we monitor at the elbow, we want to scan from bottom to top. So we want to scan in the flow of contrast because we want the contrast to actually go ahead of us so I can do that collateral filling quite nicely. I always use 100 mils of contrast. Here, I don't use any protocols. I don't do weight-based protocol. I don't do anything as such. Always 100 mils contrast, but I always use 200 mils saline. Now, we've talked about this multiple times before, but I want to repeat it again. Saline allows you to keep pushing the contrast. Now, when you're doing really long scans like peripheral CTA, definitely you need more uh, saline. Second of all, it keeps your patient hydrated, so it's actually a safety mechanism, and all the research coming out now is based on you know people having hydration therapy. Uh, third of all, it gets the contrast to your collecting system faster, but more importantly, it actually is diluted in the kidney area, and that's where a lot of reactions are occurring. So we're reducing this on multiple levels. And so make sure the head's first, patient is prone, and make sure the arm is in the center of the machine, not the patient, because the arm is on the periphery, okay? Also, if you're going to do like shoulder inlet or outlet uh, imaging techniques, just make sure you put the patient in the head holder and arms completely by their side. And make sure you have the arms with the palm facing up. So in this image here, you see the palm facing down. We actually want it to face up. Now, if we look at arterial calculations. All right. Now, so remember this. Always inject on the opposite arm. Okay, so if you're doing a right arm angiogram, always use the left injection site. I always perform my test bolus at the elbow. You want to be halfway through the flow that you're chasing or imaging. So you're going to scan from the ascending aorta and you're going to scan to the fingertips and you want to make sure that you always do your region of interest at the elbow. Okay. Now, I always use 200 mils of Salem. We've said this before. And if you don't have, um, you know, some sort of contrast or techniques, make sure you can step down contrast. You can, you know, you can go 40 mils of contrast or 4.5 mils a second. You can do a second phase, 10 mils of contrast at 3.5 mils a second, and the third phase at 20 mils of contrast at 3 mils a second. You can go that complex if you want, but I don't do that. I really just give, you know, 4 mils a second, 100 mils of contrast, 200 saline, monitor at the elbow, inject in the opposite arm, and just go for it and watch it, and that will turn out perfect and simple as that. And so sometimes, and the reason why we do this is because that if we look at the contrast media flow dynamics, as the contrast comes up in the aorta, you always want about a two-second delay to get to the peripheries and the extremities. So then that's why we always need to scan from the chest to the fingertips, but we monitor at the elbow because by the time we scan halfway through it, it's right at the fingertips and we've got good feeling. That's something to really pay attention to. Let's look at some venous uh, calculations. So whenever I do a venogram, I always also do the elbow. So I wait for the contrast to come back, and I monitor at the region of interest, and then I just, again, I scan. Now, if I had to do bilateral arm venogram, I would have my two syringes, and in each syringe I'd put, you know, 30 mils of contrast, 70 mils of saline, and I inject them both 50-50 at the same time. Now, that's if I'm doing a bilateral venogram or if I'm doing a proper SVC study.
Now, if I can't see this, uh, or I don't have a, a, a double barrel injector, I'm sorry, you're going to have to do indirect venography. And so whenever I do bilateral venograms and I, I'm, I do my ROI at the uh, uh, elbow, I always look at the periphery vessels around the elbow. Once they start to fill, I know that's my time to peak. Then I start from my fingers up because we want to work in the opposite direction. And that works really well every single time. So here, this is an example of what I'm saying for. So you have two syringes, okay, 30 mils of contrast, 70 mils of setup. Make sure your actual syringe or your injector is parallel to the floor because contrast is heavier than water. And so you're going to split them perfectly. And then you make sure also that you have a cannula in each arm. So if I look at this next image here and look at my arrows, my two red arrows, I have each uh, injection or, or line from each syringe going into each arm. When I inject them, I inject them both at three mils a second and I inject them both at the same time. And where do I monitor? I monitor then at this point in time at the superior vena cava. So here, this is when you get good superior vena cava uh, venograms. And you're using a lot less contrast because you're only using, you know, in a venogram, you know, 60 mils. Now let's look at lower extremity arteriograms and venograms. So we know now here, I always use 100 kVT. All right. Now I know a lot of people always have a second, uh, you know, um, Scan ready to go just in case we outrun it, but I'm going to give you the tips and tricks here. So I always use 100 kVp. I always go from the diaphragm down to the feet. Make sure your feet are always, you know, by their sides. And so sometimes you just put like a tourniquet, but don't put too much pressure on them. Okay. Standard protocol again, you know, you can use model based iterative reconstruction at 80 kVp, but remember only if you're super advanced. Or if you have very small patients, so usually patients, um, um, you know, usually patients that you know don't have that much amount of, you know, uh, you know, tissue. So people in like Southeast Asia, China, um, you know, Cambodia, uh, India, Pakistan, where they they don't have much tissue structure compared to the West, you could potentially use eighty kVp, but very, very, very careful with that. Now. Let's look at where I do my bolus triggering. I know there's people that do two types. Some do it at the common femoral arch and then some do it at the popliteal fossa. Some people do it at the top. There's so many ways to do it, but let me tell you how I do it. Now, if I used to do bolus triggering in this case, okay, I don't, if you want to do test bolus, you definitely can, <coughs> excuse me, but it's really up to you. I prefer to do bolus triggering and then what I do is I basically, I put a region of interest on, um, on, on outside in the air, okay, <clears throat> and I'll watch the contrast coming through because remember we talked about head and neck CTA. If you're right-legged, your blood flow is going to be faster compared to your left leg. So you're going to have a mismatch and you want to make sure you see both of them fill up at the same time. Contrast volume 100 mils, salon volume 200 mils. I always do my region of interest at the popliteal fossa because that is about 70% of the way. And then once I reach the threshold or when I see contrast, the table moves up and I scan top to bottom or from the liver down to the digits. So this way you never ever, ever have to have a second box ready because you'll get it perfect every single time. Trust me and I promise you. And so make sure the feet are always together. You know, you can put a tourniquet on, make sure the patient is feet first, you know, arm up on the machine, like what we've talked about previously. And, you know, you get really good results every single time. Now, if I wanted to do a step down contrast media technique, I can, but I don't really have to. This is more for the Western people because these patients are usually greater than 180 centimeters in length. Um, and they're really tall, so you need the contrast to last longer. But really, for me, it doesn't really affect it at all. I just go straight for the 100 mils of contrast, 4 mils a second, and remember, it's the same as the upper angiogram. Never go for a pitch greater than 1.1. 1 
because if you actually go too fast, you're going to outrun your contrast, and that's why you always need that second one there. So whenever I'm doing my test bolus at the popliteal fossa for the arteriogram, once the contrast reaches there and the table moves up, it takes three to four seconds, sometimes five. Within five seconds, contrast is already at the toes. So when you get the one swoop scan, it'll be a perfect angiogram, I promise you. And so usually, again, it's same as the upper extremity. You're going to get about two to three second difference between the, as the aorta is pushing relative to the uh, extremity flow. Now let's do venograms. Now this is interesting. So you can do two types of venograms here um, and, and the same as the upper extremity. You can do um, indirect venogram where you just inject contrast and you scan at 90 seconds. That way you just see contrast fill up in the venous system, but it's not going to be very dense. Or you could do uh, my technique where I do direct venogram, uh, where I do bilateral foot injection, like what we did before in the upper arm for the SVC. We can do it for the lower limb. And by that way, 30 mils of contrast, 70 mils of saline in each syringe. And I just um, inject at three mils a second, but I monitor at the inferior vena cava because I want the contrast to go up in both legs, both feet, and go up to the IVC. But this technique will fail if you do not use a tourniquet on each leg at you know 10 centimeters above the site of injection. And I'll tell you why. When you inject in contrast, it always goes into the peripheral circulation. And this peripheral circulation definitely will not go into the deep venous circulation where all the thrombosis is. So that's why if you have your cannula 10 centimeters above, put a tourniquet very tight. So as the contrast goes through, it can't go to the periphery venous circulation or go into the deep circulation. Once it goes into deep circulation, that's where all the blood clots are sitting. Okay, and we can find that out quite nicely. So normally, this is what I'll do. I'll put in uh, an, uh, a cannula. Uh, in each foot and remember with the blue cannulas you can go 2.5 mils a second it's fine you know and remember in each syringe 30 mils of contrast 70 mils of saline you know two and a half mils a second or three mils a second and we inject them both at the same time and as the contrast goes up and we see it in the inferior vena cava you scan uh, from the IVC down to the actual uh, digits And so again, you know, once we reach contrast in the digits, okay, because we're not scanning indirect now, we're scanning direct venography. So the contrast has come back in the IVC. So once it goes to the arterial system, goes to the venous, that's indirect venography, but we're di directly injection into the venous system. And so once it reaches the IVC through a region of interest, boom, scan, you know, top to bottom or from the liver down to the digits. So let's have a look at some cases. So this one here is uh, a typical uh, patient for a uh, subclavian angiogram. Have a look how nicely it is. You don't see the SVC artifact because we actually use my thoracic CTA formula and protocol, which we, we talked about two lectures ago. Here, and, and when you want to present the information, this study was done to look if there was any obstruction between the actual clavicle and the first rib, which we call this outlet obstruction. And in this case, there actually was good flow, okay? Now, if I look at the next case here, this is a wrist angiogram. Remember that I told you we need to wait long enough at the level of the elbow to see how this contrast is filling up. Now, this was a diabetic patient, okay? Uh, the central uh, ulna and radial arteries were really good, but the digital arteries were poorly enhanced. This guy had vasculitis. This is exactly what it looks like. Now, this is an interesting case I'm going to share with you right now. So, in this te technique, um, you know, this was a patient that was, you know, um, uh, they tried to assassinate him in the, in the Middle East. He flew to our hospital. He had a very complex network. He had a really large arm, which was a dematus. He couldn't raise his arm up. As you can see in the image, it's quite large. So what we did was we used 120 kVP protocol, you know, 80 mils of contrast. Uh, I used 120 mils of saline, 
And, you know, I did my region of interest at the common femoral artery. And then I I added an extra three seconds because I knew that I could not see the flow going in the arm because of the high edema. And if you have a look at it in a lot more detail, the patient actually ended up having a an AVM, a traumatic AVM. He had two stents put in on top of each other. One ended up restenosing, but we found a large collateral network of blood supply going from his neck back into the lateral cervical branches and also the lateral circumferen- circumferential branches of, from the subclavian artery. So this patient was actually going to uh, look like he was going to lose his arm until further intervention was put in, and which was a successful case. Now remember, these patients, you're not going to get anything perfect. Also, this is another one here where we have, you know, inlet and outlet obstruction. So you're going to have to do two angiograms, one arm by the side, okay, and one above the head. Now, whenever you do the one above the head, make sure you always do it at the elbow because once it obstructs, you want to see what happens post stenosis. And as you can see on the image here to your left, you have reduced blood supply and you can actually see the clavicle and the rib completely squashing that subclavian artery. This is another example of a lower limb angiogram. We had a bifemoral um, uh, operation where they did a bypass because there was no more blood supply going down the left side. And we actually found at the level of the insertion site on the left leg, there was a 99% stenosis. And after the stenosis, there was this large aneurysm. So this is why I always like to do popliteal artery because whatever's going to happen at the top, everything's going to go and flow in the right direction as it should. Here, this is an, the same patient. So he also had an endoluminal stent. And so with this endoluminal stent, we actually found there was a ruptured vessel posteriorly and it was a pseudoaneurysm. So you're really, really are allowing time for contrast to move and, and circulate accordingly. Now, popliteal aneurysms. You know, this is very common in a lot of people. And this is why I always like to do it at the popliteal fossa because it usually sits above the actual knee joint. So whenever you put in your region of interest, I always put it at the knee joint itself because 90% of pathologies uh, happen, whether you can have a stenosis or aneurysms, that happen above the knee joint. So this is really interesting. Uh, and this is based on experience. It's not medically proven. This is based on my experience. So this is why I always do my region of interest there. So whatever pathology I have, I'm always going to be safe. And just remember with your timing bolus, always, always check your pre-slice scan for any evidence of aneurysm. So you can usually see it there. So you can see the image on your left. You've got contrast in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the femoral artery as well as the posterior tibial, and you can actually see that aneurysm. So always, always, always like to go to the joint space. And if you want, a little bit lower, maybe two centimeters below, and, and you'll be fine as well. But usually that works really good every single time. Remember we talked about that, you know, whenever you're doing angiograms, it's not just about looking at vessels, it's also looking for tumors. Now, this is a typical hypervascular tumor. Now, because we waited long enough and we actually saw the extent of the vessel going around it, this is so easy. They'll just go in and cut it out and it's going to be safe for the patient. It's not going to be dangerous at all. Because remember, in tumor imaging, especially hypervascular lesions, you want to make sure you want to see the vessel relative to the lesion so you can show surgeons their surgical pathways to see if it is actually clear or not or easy enough for them to go and operate without causing any further issues like performing bypasses and so forth because of the vessels. This is an interesting study. Now, here, this was a a patient who was shot and, uh, you know, he, you can actually see in the axial image, there's a lot of air pockets there. And remember that sometimes when you, or most of the times when you're doing your lower limb or upper limb angiograms, and if you're doing both, you're going to have one side that's really nicely filled with contrast, and the other side's going to have venous contamination. Because depending on which leg dominant you are, sometimes you're going to have fast or slow circulation. So don't feel that you've done a bad job. In actual fact, you've done a perfect job because you end up filling both circulations nicely. So in this case, this is a patient that was shot in the back of the leg. 
Okay, we had to do an angiogram just to ensure that was there any vessels ruptured. We did it perfectly. And guess what? You know, there was a bit of venous contamination in there. The bullet had missed his vessel, as you can see, to the right side of your image there on the periphery. It missed it by about a centimeter from rupturing his vessel in the back of his knee. So you can really ensure that you do really good angiograms. And you know, even in trauma patients, especially in shootings and stabbings or large car accidents. This is another one of a mitotic aneurysm. So here you can actually see this is in the popliteal fossa. And again, remember I told you a lot of diseases like to happen there. I just scanned below. It filled up quite nicely. You can see the pseudo filling there. You can actually see that T or inverted T posterior, um, you know, which is wrapping around the vessel. But we don't really... We're not really bothered if we got it perfect or not in terms of the filling of the aneurysm because we got the vessel filled up well. So this is an, a perfect example that you can get aneurysms, stenosis, uh, infective aneurysms, gunshots, stabbings. If you use this technique, it will fill up all the pathology every single time. Also, young people and athletes have popliteal entra entrapment. So this is where the ligament comes across posteriorly and completely compresses the vessel. And so what happens is you're going to get reduced flow going to the lower leg every single time. So in this case here, when we did it at the popliteal fossa, we saw both um, uh, you know, uh, uh, vessels fill up nicely with contrast enhancement. Okay, And then as they flow down, it was really, really good, and we saw this quite nicely. But you can actually see the image to your right, okay, which is the patient's right leg as well. Okay, you can actually see the vessel coming off on an angle, and actually the ligament has compressed it. Now, this is a case here. This is a video where what we did was we looked at doing a bolus technique where we looked at both feet. We injected contrast all the way up, and you can actually see the large thrombus and, 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 and your, uh, thrombus in the common femoral arteries as well as extending up to the iliac artery and also here you can actually see that CT angiogram where they placed this large uh, catheter okay and so with this catheter and so forth um, it got stuck in there because of the thrombus and so we had a large collateral supply. Now, as you can see, we did both for injection when we scanned from the IVC down. So, you know, just a few pitfalls. Just remember, short acquisition times can reduce to uh, can reduce your enhancements. So that's why I never go for a pitch, a pitch um, faster than 1.1. 1 .1. I ideally recommend a pitch of one on all CT scans. The risk of outrunning the bolus, well, we've really talked about that now because in the upper extremity, always do the elbow for angiograms for the artery and for the lower extremity, do popliteal fossa. If we're doing venograms, do it at the SVC because it all comes back to the SVC. And for the venogram in the lower leg, you go for the uh, IVC, okay? Um, you know, severe calcification, don't worry, don't be alerted by it. Sometimes you're going to get different fillings from right side or left side. It really depends, so just be careful on that. And so I'd like to thank you all once again for uh, listening to me in this lecture. Please visit mdct.com.au. You know, we've just released another uh, series on our YouTube lectures that we have the links in the website, so you can just uh, sign in and you can watch them there, uh, which are free. Uh, we have thousands of cases, ebooks. Uh, we also have online courses as well uh, that you can take in your own time and learn at your own pace. And again, uh, with these online courses that we do, uh, I give so much detail. And, you know, for one course, you know, it's eight hours worth of lectures just on, for example, one course or one topic. And so anything you guys need, please feel free to send me an email. And, you know, next week coming up, we have the cardiac and coronary CT angiography lecture series. Now that is really going to be exciting and that's going to be intense actually because we're going to talk about anatomy, pathology, scanning contrast protocols and uh, you know and we're going to do pediatric stuff as well. So it's a really really interesting next four weeks 
And once again, thank you to Bayer so much. You know, you're really investing in, in people's future, their education. Uh, you guys are just amazing from Leona to Yewan to Pear, uh, who is the, the boss of Bayer Asia Pacific and to the entire Bayer institution. Um, you know, I, I believe that education is, is what people uh, can give someone like me and I thank them for showing their trust in me. And so remember, uh, spread the word, pass it on social media, follow us on social media as well, mdct.com.au. You know, we'll send out the links every week. Previous lectures, we're going to send them to you as well. Don't worry. Okay. And, you know, happy learning. And back over to you, Yewan. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, Dr. Chabel, um, that was a fantastic lecture uh, on the uh, extremity. Um, and we have, in fact, a lot of questions queuing up for you to answer. So without any delay, should we start? Great. Okay, let's do it. All right. So um, let's start off firstly with uh, Giovanni Scalera. Uh, good morning from Italy. Good morning. Mansour Satar, good morning. Thank you for the nice gestures. Um, I'm sure there were some issues with slides, but I think uh, they've worked. Uh, Nguyen Nguyen, uh, good afternoon. About positioning of CT for the upper limb, how about prone position with arm raised because arm will be straight, vessel of elbow might be curved if tight uh, supine position or arm raise or down. So normally I always have it in the superman or superwoman position. That way actually the arm goes into neutral position. That is the way that I would go about it definitely. And causing the curve into the ulnar arteries and veins, look, it doesn't really matter because at that part of the, the anatomy or the vasculature, it's actually got a high amount of tension. So you're going to be fine every single time when you, when you put the arm down. Um, uh, Tariq Walizai, uh, if we need both arm or leg angiogram, then how is the method of injection of contrast? Okay, so if you're doing a, a bilateral arm angiogram, then I would inject from the foot, okay? Because then you don't want any artifact coming in from the arms or the from, from either arm, okay? So for the upper extremity, I always inject from the feet. Now, if I wanted to do bilateral leg injections, you just go through the arms for arterial phase. And for the venous phase, you can go definitely in the feet. Excellent question, Tarit. Thank you. Uh, another one is Nguyen Nguyen. Uh, for indirect venous upper limb, do you have any uh, recommendations, injection protocols, scan time delay? Excellent, excellent question. So this is what I do. I always give um, 100 mils of contrast because you need a lot of contrast and make sure it's 370 contrast because you want it to move like blood, act like blood so it can distribute in blood properly. So ultra 370 is really good for that. I would always go, um, you know, three and a half to four mils a second injection in each arm, it doesn't matter. And my scan delay is always, always at 70 seconds because it's gone into the arterial system, then the venous system back into the arterial, so it's starting to recirculate. That's when it works well. But I try and stay away from that because sometimes it's hit and miss and you really need large volumes of contrast. And make sure, <coughs> excuse me, you always use 100 or 200 mils of saline in this case. Uh, Munravi uh, Tumkosit, what is the CTA protocol for thoracic outlet syndrome? So again, like what we said before in the lecture series, arm down, do the angiogram, arm up and do another angiogram, but make sure you put your region of interest at the elbow above the area of the thoracic outlet because that allows, you know, to see if there is a reduced flow or not, but we want to make sure we fill the vessels. Excellent question. Thank you. Um, Jan uh, Pips, uh, what do you suggest of which rates of contrast for the double barrel? So can't use saline. Um, so what I always do is look for angiograms, I always go 4.5 mils a second. You know, depending on the cannulas for the venograms, you go three, 2.5, three, three and a half, depending on your cannula. Um, 
But you need to use saline because you've got to keep pushing that contrast. Now, if you don't have saline, um, again, I, I can't guarantee that you're going to get good studies. And I hope I've answered that question, uh, Jen. Okay, so uh, LL Chua, hi. Why do we need to start to scan from the liver for CTA lower limbs? Well, you always need to make sure you include the renal arteries. That is the most important thing, especially in patients who have diabetes. Now, again, if your institution decides to start from the iliac crest, just at the common femorals, or from the common iliac bifurcation, then that's fine. But I always, you know, just put a little bit more, and, and this is good to see the renal arteries. But that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. Sunita Guacha, would you please explain the lower extremity venogram scan direction again, please? So I inject into the feet, as we saw before, bilaterally. I inject, say, in each syringe, I have contrast in each one and saline in each one. So 30 contrast, 70 saline. Make sure the injector is parallel to the floor so the contrast can actually drop. And then you inject them both at the same time. Now, you do your region of interest at the inferior vena cava or at the level of the liver because once the contrast has gone up all through the feet and gone up and converges and joins at the inferior vena cava, you know you've got good contrast flow there. So this is exactly how you would do it. So thank you so much. Let's now look at Imad al Harub. For direct venogram, will I mix the 30 mils of contrast for uh, 7 mils of sal? Exactly. So in each syringe, 30 mils contrast, 70 mils saline in each one. And then when you put it flat, contrast is three times heavier than water. So it's naturally going to drop. So, yes, excellent question. Uh, Joyce Hung, um, thank you so much for the informative webinar. It is my absolute pleasure. For SVC studies, why do you need to inject from both arms? Amazing question. Now, whenever you look at the superior vena cava, you've got blood flow coming in from both directions and from both upper extremities as well as both sides of the head and neck. So if I'm injecting contrast only into one side, by the time it gets to the superior vena cava, it's already 50% mixed and lost. So that's why you should always use bilateral arm injections. This is the way that it works perfect every single time. Okay, new one, new one. Can you please summarize again uh, lower extremity protocol? We've just talked about that. What do we need to notice? Does it make hard plaque of legs move for pulmonary angiography and it makes it PE? No, it doesn't. So the only time that a PE actually breaks off uh, is when there is um, the vessels are working really, really hard. So when you're moving your legs, your vessels aren't working hard. It's only they're just increasing the peripheral supply of blood. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, Imad al Harub, uh, thank you a lot for the lecture. No worries. Direct venogram, I will mix 30. Yep. Okay, we've already answered that. Um, for what is the post injection delay for direct venogram for both upper? So, hey, man, I hear I do um, a, a, a bolus triggering. I watch it. So once I inject my contrast either in both arms or in both feet, I put a region of interest. As soon as I see contrast, I start my scan. Because remember, everyone's heart pushes out so much blood or contrast at any point in time. Um, Jen, uh, Pips, is there any access or any uh, previous webinars? Yes, we will send out an email through the website as well as Bayer will send it out. So make sure you're a member of both, okay, and, and we'll send you out a whole list and you can all go back and look at them in your own time. Okay, Edna Costa, great lecture, thank you. Is there any other way to get a copy of the slides? Yes, Edna, again, we will. you can have these up to uh, three months of, of these recorded lectures. They're going to be online. Lillian Yap, uh, thanks, Bayer, for organizing this webinar. Hi, Professor Sharbel. Can I get a link for the previous webinar? Yes, 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 I promise. Uh, and we'll send it to you as well. And, of course, uh, thank you, Lillian, from uh, Malaysia. So it looks like you're all interested in the previous lectures, which is great. All right. Rachel Moses, Sharbel, this is the first webinar I've watched. Can you briefly explain how your calculation to reduce the SVC artifact. Look, just become a member of the website. We will, uh, and also Bayer, we will send out 
all the previous lectures and we'll show you everything step by step. Now, in the previous lectures, um, we have not talked about CTP, uh, CT pulmonary angiography, but again, if you jump onto MDCT, there is a, a webinar just based on that. That's an eight hour dedicated lecture. Just jump on that and have a look. Suad so Talib, my great friend from Australia, thank you so much for the gratitude. I appreciate it. Wid Addison from Australia, um, uh, my great friend as well, thank you. So if, um, for example, mastectomy or breast cancer and you're unable to use a particular arm, where is the best alternate option for the cannulation of the upper arms? So you're going to have to go into the feet, okay? That's the best way. In actual fact, the feet is better because you're not going to get that SVC artifact. So feet, you can use one side. It's even better. So excellent question. Thank you so much, Wynn. Um, this next uh, person's name, I'm really, really sorry if I'm going to say it wrong. I'm not very good with pronouncing names. But Tunga Mirai Ishe Vuti, what injection and delay would you recommend with the 128 slots? So all of these protocols I've talked to you today are for 16 slices and, and they can work all the way up to 640 slice, dual energy, um, you know, the biggest machines because I've used these all over the world when I've traveled all over uh, Asia Pacific with Bayer and also Europe. It, this works on all of them and we've tested on all of them, so no problem. Uh, Vodimir Mitokone, uh, thank you for the lecture. It is my absolute pleasure. Sara, my great friend from Australia, thank you for the... Um, the gratitude. Uh, Vladimir, could you show us some cases with uh, direct CT venographies? Yes, yeah, so there was that video that I showed you um, that showed you that spinning leg and, and how we injected both uh, from, from the bottom up. So it's on slide number 59. Uh, Joyti Ranjan Parida, thank you so much uh, from Audition India. And yes, Joyti, thank you so much. Every week you're always with us. Really appreciate your support and the gratitude. Uh, Dennis Wu, my great friend from Australia. Hello from Sydney. Uh, is MRI AJ tricks better than CT for vascular tumor in hand, wrist, or foot diagnosis? That's actually a fantastic question because in actual fact, uh, MRI at gadolinium, uh, and, and especially if you're using Gadavist, uh, the timings are completely different. And also we have to look at the different um, hydration status of patients to get better. And, and that is probably a whole lecture on its own. But be rest assured, um, next month uh, I'll be giving two lectures with Bayer, one on breast MRI and, and gadolinium delivery, and the other one is going to be on neuroradiology and gadolinium delivery with perfusion studies and so forth. So we're going to have a, a good one next month. So please make sure you're with the Bayer team and MDCT. All right, Joyce uh, Hung, a few days ago, we scanned a 22-year-old CTR of the legs. I monitored at L4. I used 120 mils of contrast at a staggered injection rate, 5, 4, 3 mils, followed by saline. The top half of the scan was amazing, but when we got to the legs, it seems that the contrast was already in the venous system. I'm guessing because she's a very young patient with fast flow. Is there anything we could have changed to avoid this problem? Joyce um, now, this is an amazing question and a great case study. All right, so let's go. First of all, I never use four, five mils a second, okay? Second of all, we're, we're starting, um, at, you know, if you're monitoring at, if you're going at five mils a second, you're pushing it really fast in the arterial system. So by the time you get to the legs, it's already too late. You could have just monitored, okay, with usually a 22-year-old, I don't know if it's male or female, I would have just monitored at the popliteal fossa. As soon as I see contrast in either one of the legs, the scan moves up and I scan one run. And that's fine. Trust me. Sometimes you are going to get a venous contamination back. And, and okay, she's a, a, a young female. So what I would have done is I would have gone, if she's young, she's 22, three and a half mils a second. But make sure, did you check your pitch? Remember, if you also have a pitch that's too slow, less than one or one, then your machine is actually moving slower. So you've got to have a picture of 1.1. I hope this answers the question. And that is an excellent question. Um, new and new one. For angiography of the both arms, can we inject in jugular vein instead of leg? I, I completely, uh, in, in the last 20 years, I have stayed away from jugular vein injections. I've only had to do it once when it was between life and death 
we prefer to go to legs. But again, if the legs don't work, then you can go to uh, angiography and then that can put you a direct uh, femoral line, okay, a venous femoral line, and that can work really well or, or they can do it under ultrasound. So excellent question, uh, Nguyen, and, um, you know, it is, it is a tough, you know, balance which, which is the right one to actually do. The next question is uh, Janice Yeo. Uh, what do you suggest for scanning upper limb for vasospasm in pediatrics? Is it better to do bilateral arms or just the arm of concern? Is pre-contrast scan necessary? Wow. So this is what I would do. I would always, always, for bilateral arms in pediatrics, always use a foot injection, and I would not need a pre-contrast scan at all, just an angiogram. And you can go usually 1.5 to 2 mils a second is fine. And depending on the weight, I usually just go, you know, 1 to 2 mils per kilo, depending on the size of the child. Excellent question. Uh, S. Uh, Vidovic, using a level of popliteal fossa as region of interest for contrast bowl are triggered dangerous, as this is where a lot happens. How do you keep your staff from getting distracted? Also, when one leg is delayed, maybe too slow or never come in, then what do you tell your staff to trigger? Excellent question. So first of all, you already know when you first look at the patient if you have good flow or poor flow. Second of all, you know, usually at the popliteal fossa, you want 70% of the contrast, so you've got to watch both. If one comes in and you just see a little bit in the other one, start your scan. You don't have to wait for them to see both bright before you scan. If one's bright, one's just a little bit bright, then you go up and scan. But remember, you're going to have one side that's going to actually be uh, venous contaminated because one's faster than the other. Now, remember, how do you tell your staff from being distracted? Well, you know... about 50 50 so you're telling the machine that one inject one syringe is contrast one is saline and injecting both mixing 50 50 but in actual fact each syringe has 30 contrast 70 saline all right kylie neil great lecture mate thank you a member of mdct.com.au excellent appreciate it thank you uh, Jan uh, Pips, thank you very much for this webinar. Very informative and easy to understand. Thank you. Jane, let me tell you, um, I'm so grateful that Bayer has allowed me to, to talk because remember, I have 20 years of clinical scanning experience as well as my big academic uh, push on top of that. So this allows us to actually be able to give a lot of information out, which is easy to understand because things are complex. People make things complex. And, and it's tough, so this takes a lot of time, but thank you so much, Jane. Appreciate it. Uh, it works really good for the upper extremity venogram indirect. For indirect venogram of the lower extremity, I always use 90 seconds, so there's a 20 second difference. Uh, Joy T. Pande, excellent seminar, sir, highly appreciated. And yes, we will send you all previous lectures, I promise. Naveen Kumar, thank you, we will send you the previous links. Tariq Walizai from Afghanistan, oh, welcome, welcome, welcome from Afghanistan. It is amazing to have you guys on board. All right. Uh, We'll send you all out the previous lectures, everybody. Okay, you've sent me uh, these questions seven times over. I promise we'll send them to you. I promise. Melvin Bernard de la Pena. Hi, Dr. Charbel. Thank you once again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bayer, for sponsoring. They're amazing. I'm hoping you'll have a webinar on CTPA soon. An actual fact, uh, the CTPA webinar, um, uh, we've put it into the coronary. Unfortunately, we had to take it out. However... Um, jump online to MDCT. We have it there, and, and, and it's um, it's a full, dedicated eight-hour lecture series just on CTPA. When can we have the site to join Bayer? When I was looking for a link, it keeps sending me to Bayer Veterinary Education, which is fine, having a pack of dogs, but not where I'm getting recognized CPD. When, okay, we will keep sending them out to you. 
Um, Bayer, unfortunately, as of yet, don't have the links on their webpage, but I'm sure they will look into that. And once they have it, I will send it out through mdct.com.au. I promise. All right. Uh, Vladimir, what is the best timing for lower limb indirect scene venography? So it's 90 seconds. Is there any contraindications for direct CT venography for the lower limb? Yeah, great question. So remember this. If you're injecting directly into the vein, you're not going to rupture the, um, the what do you call it, the actual thrombus that's sitting there. Because you've got to remember the pressure from the blood that's actually pushing up is four times higher than the injection that we're giving. So in that way, you're completely safe, I promise. Okay. Uh, Vidovic, you touched on compression to send a contrast to the deep veins. Have you considered using higher injection rates to improve travel through the veins of more resistance? Actually, in fact, because remember, as contrast comes in, we're injecting the peripheral system, so it's going to stay in the peripheral. And in the central, we're having all the big blood flow from the muscles. It mixes by the time it gets to the IVC. So high injection rates, and you, you've got a cannula in the foot, you've got to remember of safety and pressure. Um, Hamad Akram, hi. Uh, Emilio Lania, leg runoffs, bolus tracking at knee. What's the start delay for the bolus tracking? Excellent question. 15 seconds. So once you inject, I'll wait 15 seconds and then start your bolus tracking. That works good every time. Nguyen Nguyen. Hi, Dr. Saidi. I read one article that say limitation of direct venous scan is that we cannot see all venous and they suggest to scan direct and indirect together. Do you have any recommendations? Well, it depends what you're looking for. So if you're looking for thrombosis, it's only going to happen in the deep circulation, not in the peripheral. So usually we always go direct venogram, as I showed you in that video before, and that works really well. Now, it really depends on what type of pathology you're looking for. For indirect venogram, we tend not to do it that much because you can normally see after a chest, abdomen, pelvis, or if you're going to do a CTPA study or so forth. Uh, Jane Pips, the question I had earlier was that we don't use double syringe injector. We only use a single and no saline bolus. Oh, my goodness. So, no, what I would do is, okay, you have a single syringe, and in the syringe, it takes up, usually all syringes take up 200 mils. So, you fill up your 100 mils of contrast first, then your 100 mils of saline, and then tip it. So, you're going to have a total of 200 mils of fluid going into the patient. Once you tip it, the contrast, because it's three times heavier than water, it's going to drop to the bottom. So then watch it. And you've got to wait about two to three minutes. I would not increase the flow rate. I'd still keep it at is 4.5 mils a second. Don't worry. That will still work really good. And you can get a four mils a second, depending on which scan you have. Heltara uh, Ramadenika. Um, what is your opinion for contrast on the central venous cath or central vein catheter line, especially for bilateral arm angiography? Uh, if somehow, do you not recommend it? No actual fact. If you have a CVC line and it is approved for contrast media injection through a mechanical injector, use it. If it's not approved, you can't use it because then you're, you're actually going to split the actual lumen, which can actually cause more problems for the patient. And second of all, make sure it's heparin locked. If the CVC is not heparin locked and you're injecting contrast to the flow rate, usually at the bottom, it starts to make blood clots around the actual the catheter. So be careful. Just double check. Um, hi, can we scan single arm limb angiogram by putting cannula in opposite side? Absolutely, Muhammad. We said that before, and you're absolutely correct. Rachel Moses, thanks for the great webinar. Can it be worthwhile using a very helical pitch, especially for upper extremity angio, if arm raised above the head? Absolutely. So the variable rich... The pitch, you'd never want to get anything faster than 1.1, and you never want to get anything slower than 0.9. So that's the range of pitch that you need to be working with. Naveen Kumar, thank you for the webinar. If a patient couldn't raise uh, both arms up, if we keep it on the side of the body, how to use this technique? So I would use the same injection technique, um, but if what I'll do is I'll use the foot to inject because then I won't get that SVC artifact or artifact from the opposite arm coming in. And make sure you have 120 KVP protocol. Uh, Sarah, thanks for the lecture. Looking forward to the next one as I missed part of it. That's okay. We'll send it out. Don't worry. Uh, Joyce, you mentioned that 
is uh, it is best to cannula in the basilic vein. Should this also be applied for cardiacs instead of cannulating in the hand? Joyce, amazing question. All should be in the cubital fossa and all should be in the basilic vein. Absolutely. Even if it's angiogram, oncology scan, routine injections, basilic veins are the safest ones and they're really good. So uh, Reja uh, Kosikinen, is the 200 mil saline too much for someone with fluid overload? So if a patient has left heart failure or chronic cardiac failure or pulmonary edema, you do not give, um, you only give maximum 100 mil saline. But other than that, if they normally uh, have their normal urine output, 200 mils is fine. Because 200 mils is less than, is about three quarters of a bottle of water that people normally drink. Great. So we've answered 63 questions. Now we'll probably wait another minute or so to see if there are any more questions. But today's question was really, really good. I liked it. Uh, Julian Douglas, good day. Which modality is best to demonstrate lower limb peripheral arterial disease? Well, I actually still think it's CT. Even though MRI is quite good, but remember, MRI you can't see the uh, the extent of 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 calcification. That's why lower limb angiography is really good. But in MRI is also really good. But again, it's time consuming, and uh, it, it takes a lot of time to set the patient up and so forth. But you know, I think when you look at the sensitivity and specificity for detecting disease, um, you know, CT still outperforms MRI. But excellent question. Thank you so much, Julian. That's a great question. Maybe uh, one more, two more questions waiting. So everybody, just remember, you know, go back to this presentation, you know, think about it. Always ask, what are you looking for? What's the disease? And if you know you're going to have stenosis and blockages in the lower limb angiogram in the arterial phase, go below that area. Don't do a pre-contrast for the whole lower limb. You don't need it. Arterial phase is fine. And for the venogram, you don't need pre-contrast. Uh, uh, venogram is just fine. Great. So we have one more. Oh, okay, Muhammad Akram, thank you so much. Uh, I will keep it up. You guys give me the energy and the strength. And Bayer gives me this unlimited uh, floor to, to share my work. Thank you so much. Great, I think we're done, uh, Yiwon. Uh, back over to you. And again, thank you so much to you and Bea. I really appreciate it for allowing me to share my knowledge and, and everything. Well, thank you, Dr. Chabelle. Um, that was another fantastic, fantastic lecture. Um, and um, thank you all participants again to join us tonight uh, and staying with us to explore everything about the peripheral and geography. And that was our last topic of the uh, May CTA Imaging Optimization Series. Um, just before you leave, um, could you please um, see the survey button on the bottom of the screen? Uh, you will see the five gray box. And then if you click the first button from the right, uh, this will actually lead you to five short survey questions. And then uh, your feedbacks um, are the ones that's actually making our webinar improve uh, every week. So would really greatly appreciate if you can give us like any kind of feedback would be welcome so next week actually we are uh, we have approached our final topic of our three um, month uh, journey of our webinar series with dr chabelle and it's going to be on cardiac and coronary cta topic uh, we are going to cover everything of our cardiac coronary cta in very detailed manner so please uh, come and join us so thank you so much for tonight um, and I'll see you again next week. Bye.